But now the questions don't get any easier. So if I give you the premise that nervous systems by their nature are what's called autopoetic, they're self-assembling, and they self-assemble so as to be communicative, and it's not just nerves, they do this also by virtue of their accessory cells called glia. We used to think when I first started in the field that glial cells were nothing more than what their Latin name would imply, glue. They're the stick together of the nervous system. No, no, no. We recognize now that they too are communicative cells, both between themselves and with neurons, that then increases the communicative capacity of the neural system. It's an amplifier. It's a focusing device. And there seems to be, indeed, other cells that are capable of communicating with brain cells, tentatively immunological cells from the periphery, and there are those that even say certain types of connective tissue may indeed give nerve cells and glial cells input that then allow them to intuit what's going on in here and out there. But given that, I'm going to deal you a couple of questions. And they're fun questions to think about, but they're also dangerous questions because what they force us to do is to acknowledge that we're really on a cognitive crest. And as the wave propels us forward, we are compelled to acknowledge this new knowledge. Abandon what we thought before, and we must do so in a way that while doctrinal, it's not dogmatic. What are the questions? Do all brains give rise to minds? They need not be my mind. Certainly not. They need not be human minds. No, no. Why? Because, well, you know, human minds exist in humans. Human minds do things that are important for humans to do. Moreover, let's face it, his mind is not the same as mine. Why? Because perhaps he does different things than I do. He may be a physicist or an artist or a musician or a psychologist, which is completely different than what I do. In fact, not only is his mind distinct from mine with regard to the computations that need to be done, but there are those that would argue that the microstructure of his brain by virtue of the experience that he's had and what he needs to do with those nerves is going to be different than mine besides. So it's not just a question of saying, do all brains give rise to human minds? Do all brains, do all aggregates of nerve cells when they get together give rise to minds of some sort? We have to sort of stretch our constraints and our boundaries of what this thing, mind, is based upon the definitions that I just gave you. Another question, is the mind the self? That's a question that has many, many implications. If in fact the mind is the self, or at least part of the self, then we have to say, well, does anything that have a brain therefore have a self? Now let's not be anthropocentric. Not myself, not a human self, but it might be unimportant to think whether or not a bonobo has a human self, whether a cat has a human self. They don't need to. But is there a self there? Is there the ability to discriminate from what's inside and what's outside and be aware and sentient that they're different? and be aware that they exist. What the French refer to as the moi ete of existence, the meanness of me. And how much brain, how much nervous system connectivity, not just nerve cells, but nervous system connectivity, is necessary and or sufficient to give rise to a mind, and ergo by extension, a self. What this really takes us to is what I call the horizon of possible selves. This is Giordano's Inferno. <laughs> Abandon all of your dogma, all ye who enter the room. You know, it was Rene Descartes who claimed, with I, I think benevolent undertones, that animals do not exist ontologically. They are not identical to humans in their stature, their status. They ain't us. 
Now, let's give Rene a nod where it's deserved. I mean, he's really been taken over the coals. In neuroscience, we look at the idea of body versus mind, brain versus mind, and go, that's frank dualism. We scoff. And then we look at Descartes and we go, oh my gosh, you know, he, he took away any kind of ontological status to animals, and what that did is that created this tidal wave in the field for the next several hundred years. Wait, wait, wait. he did it for good reason. One of the reasons is that you have to re understand that at that period of time, animals were actually held legally responsible. A quick tour through medical history and, and through the history of science throughout much of the past six, seven hundred years revealed that animals stood trial. They were whipped. They were hung because they bit somebody. Oh, they didn't behave. And Descartes said, well, that's stupid. Why are you doing this? And of course, I think in many ways that was prescient. Remember, rights, rights are a human convention. Moral obligation, moral regard, well, that's something quite different. So to make an argument to say that animals have rights, that would mean that they would have to figure out what those rights are. That would be like me saying, well, I have particular rights within a wolf community. <laughs> I don't know what they are. But then again, I really can't exactly communicate with the alpha wolf to figure out what I should do and who I should mate with in that pack. So there's an irrelevance there. And in some ways, Descartes figured that out. But you know, like so many other things, you say it, a few hundred years go by, and they're going to bastardize what you say. And so what tended to happen is the ontological status of animals, based upon a partial and very incipient knowledge of the way brains and minds work, fell into that categoric that says they simply are not. It also allowed particular doctrine, dogma, to arise that said, we're special. And because we're special, we can use X, Y, and Z, and we can interpret a whole bunch of different writings to do that. All right, you know, ignorance is bliss. But my argument that I hope you'll leave this room with is, we're not that ignorant anymore. And real ignorance is when we know particular things or are presented with particular truths, all be they contingent, and we choose to ignore them. Yeah, that's real ignorance. So the question then becomes, at this horizon of possible selves, given this brain-mind self-relationship, who and what has a self? Me? Do I? It's not a rhetorical question. I guess I'm asking you. I stand before you. I'm walking, talking. I seem to be relatively animated. My eyes light up when I talk. I look at my beautiful wife in the front row. You can see my little heart go pitter-patter, and you go, there's a self. How do you know? How do you know she wasn't popping coins in one of my orifices and winding me up before I came in here? And I'm, as Dennis says, Daniel Dennett says, a, a sophisticated zombie. I'm an automaton. I'm a pure cyborg all the way to the right of that cyborgization curve. You know, you don't know. You don't. I take it for granted that she has a self and you have a self and a mind. Why? Because you're close enough to me that I can bridge that, what's called a hermeneutic, a phenomenological hermeneutic. I intuit that since I see that you're human and I have one, eh, you must have one. I look for particular signs, your eyes light up. I go, Simon says do this, you do this. Sit, stand, shake my hand, you know, do you know some philosophy? Great, you're human. You have a self. May be necessary, uh, but I'm going to make the argument that's probably not sufficient because the only thing that allows me to do is to then exchange that information with those who can communicate that to me. The phenomenological philosophers and psychologists, for example, Carl Jaspers, Husserl, Heidegger, say what you will about those, those crew, I, rather brilliant folks, referred to this as the paradox of explanation and understanding. I understand in the first person. I tell it to you by explanation. If you don't understand what I'm explaining and can't relate it to your own experience, all bets are off. So what happens with things that can't communicate that? 